So let's continue with what John MacArthur has also to further criticize us about. I think you can show in the Fathers that there was no commitment, say, to the papacy. There was I've shown that's false. No commitment to marry, to various things. I've shown that's false. Things that the, that, that the church does in the Mass, etc., etc. Ah, so MacArthur's now saying that the Mass is not to be found in the Fathers. Okay, let's see if that's right. St. Ignatius of Antioch, writing in about 107, 110 AD. I have no taste for corruptible food, nor for the pleasures of this life. I desire the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, who is of the seed of David. And for drink, I desire his blood, which is love incorruptible. Letters of the Romans. Well, that's pretty clear in terms of the bread. But, you know, a Protestant might say, well, the blood, when he says it's love incorruptible, is symbolic. Let's see what he next says. Take note of those who hold heterodox opinions on the grace of Jesus Christ, which have come to us. And see how contrary their opinions are to the mind of God. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Saviour Jesus Christ. Flesh that suffered for our sins and that the Father in his goodness raised up again. They who deny the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. Let us to the Simonians. So having referred to the bread of God being the flesh of Jesus Christ and reiterating that the Eucharist is the flesh of Jesus Christ, the same flesh that suffered, then it's impossible to say that the blood is to be taken symbolically. After all, if you consume the flesh literally, but you don't consume the blood, but only consume it symbolically, that's absurd. If the flesh is literal, as Ignatius is saying, then you're receiving the blood, because the flesh, it's the body of Christ. It's not flesh drained of blood. It's the actual living flesh of Christ. So it includes the blood, implicitly. So when Ignatius says his blood is love incorruptible, he's referring to the fact that he poured it out for us. That's his incorruptible love. He shows it by the action of the blood pouring out course by the entire passion in fact by his entire life so that's Ignatius and that's writing shortly after the death of John the Apostle and crucially it will be in the lifetime of some of the remaining 72 disciples taught themselves by Christ Saint Irenaeus of Lyon living in the second century AD this is about 189. If the Lord were from other than the Father, how could he rightly take bread, which is of the same creation as our own, and confess it to be his body, and affirm that the mixture in the cup is his blood? So we can see this can't be symbolic, because he says the Lord has to be from the Father for Jesus to be able to say that. Clearly then, Jesus being from the Father, he can say that this bread is his body and the mixture in the cup is his blood. He goes on. Same work against heresies. He's declared the cup, a part of creation, to be his own blood from which he causes our blood to flow. And the bread, a part of creation, He's established as his own body, from which he gives increase to our bodies. When the mixed cup, that is wine and water, and the baked bread, receive the word of God and become the Eucharist, 
the body of Christ. And from these, the substance of our flesh is increased and supported. How can they say that the flesh is not capable of receiving the gift of God, which is eternal life? Flesh that is nourished by the body and blood of the Lord and is in fact a member of him. So we have a transformation of the wine, the cup and the bread to the Eucharist. As he says, becomes the Eucharist. What is the Eucharist? He says, the body of Christ. And the body is the whole body, the flesh and the blood. So clearly, Irenaeus is again making clear that this is not bread. This is not wine. After the act of consecration, as we would say. But it says here, when they receive the word of God. That's the priest speaking over them. Not just any Tom, Dick or Harry Protestant minister has to be a priest in the line of apostolic succession. As I said in a previous comment about John MacArthur's video, quoting Saint Irenaeus himself again, talking about the succession of bishops. You must be in the church with the Church of Rome and the leader of the Church of Rome, the Pope, at its head. You must be in communion with him, agree with him and his church. And it's the priests of that church which can do this, can effect the change from bread and wine to the Eucharist. Then we go to St. Clement of Alexandria, right about AD 197. Eat my flesh, Jesus says, and drink my blood. The Lord supplies us with these intimate nutrients. He delivers over his flesh and pours out his blood. And nothing is lacking for the growth of his children. And that's on the instructor of children. So again, the Lord supplies us with these intimate nutrients, his flesh and his blood. He wouldn't speak of intimate nutrients, which are really just bread or alcohol. So we have again early testaments to Catholic teaching. So John MacArthur is just uh, mistaken. Now we go to the, the Mass itself. Pope St. Clement I. Our sin will not be small if we eject from the Episcopate those who blamelessly and holily have offered its sacrifices. Blessed are those presbyters who've already finished their course and who've obtained a fruitful and perfect release. This is the context of Pope Clement, the Bishop of Rome in about AD 80, 80, 80, 70 there it says, who's written to the Corinthians who've expelled their priests, kind of in a Protestant kind of way. He's saying you must put them back in their position And these men, for our purposes, what matters, he says, these men have offered its sacrifices. Protestants don't offer sacrifices. There's no sacrifice. It's just the Lord's Supper. It's a phrase which we Catholics can use, but perhaps we shouldn't so much because it obscures what is actually the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It's not a gathering together principally for a meal. Um, kind of like an agape, a kind of love feast. Um, so here, the sacrifices are being offered. What sacrifice? The once for all sacrifice of Christ on the, cro on the cross. Protestants say, oh, so you're offering Christ again and again and again. But it was a once for all sacrifice. No, it's representing that one sacrifice again and again to the Father. You can do this in your everyday life. You, um, you might run a race and win the race. You've got your gold medal. You show it to your parents one time. You show it again and again another time. Just by way of analogy. 
St. Ignatius of Antioch, take heed then to have but one Eucharist, for there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ, and one cup to show forth the unity of his blood, one altar, as there is one bishop, along with the presbytery and deacons, my fellow servants, that so whatsoever you do, you may do it according to the will of God. Letters of the Philadelphians, circa AD 110. This gives the lie to Protestants, who can have a multiplicity of churches, and to an extent Eastern Orthodoxy, because although they say they have one faith, they are different independent churches. Call it autocephalous if you like, kind of fancy word, but you're separate churches. There's not one Eucharist. There's not one bishop. John MacArthur's crowd, if you're Orthodox and you're listening, John MacArthur's crowd could say they've got one boss, John MacArthur. You in um, the Georgian Orthodox Church or the Ukrainian Orthodox Church or the Greek Orthodox Church, you say you've got one patriarch. That's fine. But remember what our friend St. Irenaeus of Leon says, you've got to be in agreement with the Roman bishop. But one thing that the Protestants don't have, they don't have an apostolic succession. We can say that they, that the Eastern Orthodox, by and large, do. I say by and large because there's issues I want to raise on another video about that. But by and large, one can say they do. So if Ignatius can say there's one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ and one cup, this is not referring to symbolic flesh. It's not referring to bread and wine. The cup shows the unity of his blood. Mere wine can't do that. So at the end of the apostolic age, but when many of the 72 themselves, sub-apostles I'll call them, will still be around, Ignatius speaks. Then we go to AD 350, Cyril of Jerusalem. Then, having sanctified ourselves by these spiritual hymns, we beseech the merciful God to send forth his Holy Spirit upon the gifts lying before him, that he may make the bread the body of Christ and the wine the blood of Christ. For whatever the Holy Spirit has touched is surely sanctified and changed. Then, after the spiritual sacrifice, the bloodless service is completed. Over that sacrifice of propitiation, we entreat God for the common peace of the churches, for the welfare of the world, for kings, for soldiers and allies. For the sick, for the afflicted, and in a word, for all who stand in need of succour, we all pray and offer this sacrifice. Catechetical Lectures, AD 350. So the bread becomes the body of Christ, the wine becomes the blood of Christ. Whatever's touched by the Holy Spirit is sanctified and changed. It is clearly speaking of a transformation. I use it in a loose sense. I'd say transubstantiation, but don't want to trigger Protestants. I want them to concentrate. There's a transformation of the elements into the body and blood of Christ. According to St. Cyril, a father of the church, writing just after the Council of Nicaea, as it happens which Protestants regard as a valid council, but it was stuffed with Catholic bishops who believed these things. So why you Protestants adhere to the Council of Nicaea? I do not know. Well, I do know. There's a thing called cognitive dissonance. You want your cake and eat it. You want to, you want to have your cake and you want to be able to eat it. So final one, St. Gregory of Nazianz, AD 383. Cease not both to pray and to plead for me when you draw down the word by your word. 
when with a bloodless cutting you sever the body and blood of the Lord, using your voice for the sword. Letter to Amphilochius. Only priests can do this, drawing down the word by their word. And bloodlessly, the sacrifice takes place. That is the bloodless sacrifice of our Lord, which was bloodily done on the cross, but is bloodlessly done on the altars of Catholic churches, such as those where priests like St. Gregory of Nazianz, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, and all the priests down through the fathers that I've cited. This is the faith of the fathers, not John MacArthur's faith. What Protestants need to do is to bring fathers who confirm what MacArthur is alleging, but they don't because they can't. And that says, that reaffirms what I've said, that Protestantism is a central North European 16th century religion with its peculiarities due to its time, due to its geography, and due to coming out of the Catholic Church. Had it come out of, say, the Oriental Orthodox Church, it would have had a different appearance. But no matter what, these points, where it comes from, what place in in the world it comes out of, what time in history it comes out, all show it's man-made. It's the product of its time. It's not from God. And that's why you won't find the Protestant religion in the Fathers. MacArthur isn't finished, though. 